Hi, I'm Deanna Springer. On behalf of Nancy Zeman Productions and PBS Wisconsin, thank you for joining us for this special educational presentation. Please add your questions for the presenter in the chat and stay tuned for a Q&A after the lecture. Then be sure to explore everything else the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show has to offer, including beautiful quilt exhibits and an interactive vendor mall. Thank you and enjoy. Hi, welcome to Speedy Solutions to Cut and Organize Your Scraps. My name is Lori Dickman, and I'm gonna share with you today how I cut, organize, and store and use my scrap stash. I'm gonna be sharing with you today the methods and techniques that I teach in my book, Speedy Solutions to Cut and Organize Your Scrap Stash. It includes the step-by-step -step instructions that you need to cut and organize your scraps to make beautiful quilts. And it also includes five patterns. The corresponding patterns book includes 12 beautiful patterns from which you can use your own scrap stash to create beautiful scrappy quilts. I want to show you how you can easily turn piles of wrinkled fabrics and turn them into neatly cut squares organized by size and value, darks, mediums, and lights. And then you can take those squares and simply go to your sewing machine and start creating beautiful quilts. Please notice on the left-hand photo here that is quite a messy pile of fabric. To me, it is not at all inspirational. It does not get my creative juices flowing. However, that same pile of fabric was cut into beautifully cut, neat squares, separated and organized by value on the right. And if you look at that, that certainly does get my creative juices flowing. I can definitely work with that. And so I'm gonna be showing you this today. Ultimately, what I want each of you to be able to do is to adopt some of my speedy solutions so they work perfectly for you in your own quilt studio. I want you to be able to simply grab combinations of fabric squares in different values and sizes, take them to your sewing machine, and start making your next beautiful quilt. Have you ever been to the quilt shop and you found a pattern that you've just fallen in love with and you knew you needed to make it, so you brought the pattern home, only to find when you got there that it's so there's so much cutting involved that you became discouraged and you never made the quilt pattern just because you were overwhelmed with the amount of cutting involved. Well, I want to show you with my speedy solutions techniques that you can take that pattern to your own scrap stash and literally pull all of the squares that you need in the values and sizes and take that to your sewing machine and start making that quilt. So let's see how this is done. So the first thing you need to do is get organized. You need to set up a time and a place that you're going to get all of your scraps cut and organized and stored. So if you'll notice the photo in the upper right hand corner, those are just a few of the tubs of remnants of fabric scraps that I had gathered over the years. And I have done a lot of sewing, so I had a lot of scraps. And when I talk about cutting and organizing your scrap stash, this is what I'm referring to. All of the scraps that are leftover pieces and remnants and the remainder of previous projects. So I wanted to get that all cut and organized because I knew that it would be it could be used to create beautiful quilts. So what we need to do is press, cut, organize, and store to get this accomplished. The first thing we're gonna do, of course, is to press. And what I typically do when I'm going through my scrap stash is I'll grab a large handful, I'll take it over to my ironing board, and I'll lay out as many pieces as will nicely fit on the ironing board, and then I will spray and steam them. I like to use Mary Ellen's Best Press. You may have another favorite, but it's important to starch them because you're gonna need that as well as steam. Get them all neatly pressed, and then transfer them over to your cutting table. And keep pressing. Uh, piles of fabric until you've gotten quite a pile ready that you can start cutting. And then of course the next step will be cutting. Let's talk a little bit about the tools of the trade. Some of the things you're gonna need obviously are the iron, the ironing board, your starch, but you're gonna need lots of rotary blades, very sharp blades, your rotary cutter, mats, and lots of different rotary rulers. One of my favorite that I seem to be going to all the time is my six and a half inch ruler. It's, it's one that 
maneuvers around on my fabric so easily and I can cut anywhere from a one and a half to a six and a half inch square. I also make sure that I have on hand at my fingertips my long rulers, my small rulers, my fat rulers. You need all sizes ready to go. I also like to make sure that I go around my quilt studio and gather all of my template rulers, my Dresdens, my Drunkard's Paths, my Hexies, all of those and I will cut an assortment of scraps from using those templates as well. You're going to notice in some of the photos that you see in my presentation that some of the fabrics are more of an upholstery type fabric and I do cut those up into larger scraps. I like to use those for my applique quilts and my art quilts. I don't want to cut into yardage. I prefer to just grab my scrap stash when I'm working on art and applique quilts. But predominantly you'll see that I'm cutting quilting cotton. So my first scrapping wool is what I want to speak about first. Um, when I'm working through my stash, what I want to do is follow that first scrapping rule with each and every piece of fabric that I pick up. So if you look at the center photo here, this is a triangle, and my first scrapping rule is cut the largest piece possible out of each scrap. So the largest piece possible that I could cut from that black triangle is a two and a half inch square. And then I was actually able to cut one and a half inch squares from each of the remnants. And then you'll notice here on the right that I have placed uh, sticky notes on my cutting table from one and a half inches up to 10 inches. I only cut in half inch increments. I don't cut anything less than one and a half inches. And I do cut 12 and a half inch background uh, squares also for my applique. But it's predominantly one and a half to 10 inches. You're gonna to want to remove selve edges. I speak about a number of things in my techniques book and one of them is the selve edge rule. You must remove the selve edges from all scraps, from all the squares that you're gonna be using, as well as from seams if you're seaming your backing. So it's really important to always remove selve edges whenever you are quilting. What do you do with the really small scraps? As I'm going through my stash and cutting them, I find that you're gonna have a lot of really small pieces. And I didn't really wanna throw those away. So in my techniques book, you'll find a pattern for a pet pillow. I make up the pet pillow and I'll clip it to my cutting table or my tape it to my cutting table. And then every six to eight months, I'll have it filled with tiny scraps and our pet receives a new pillow. And then bias squares. You're going to be running across a number of bias scraps as you're going through your stash. And it's really important that you're very cautious and careful with them. Um, they need to be starched well and you need to be gentle with them. The best procedure to follow when you run across bias scraps is to cut small squares from those. This is the only time that I break my first scrapping rule where I normally would cut the largest piece possible. With these bias scraps, I would cut a small square. Typically, I cut one and a half inch squares from these, but sometimes maybe two inch. The important thing to remember is that each square must remain on grain. It's gotta be on the straight of grain as closely as possible. So you need to study each of the scraps locate the lengthwise and crosswise grain of thread and lay your ruler upon that thread and then make your first cut and then every cut from that point on will be on the straight of grain. You're going to run into odd shaped squares throughout your stash and just locate a straight edge if you can. In fact, many times with these previous projects that you've been working on, there is going to remain a straight edge somewhere on that scrap. And you can actually use that then as you start making your first cut. So follow that if you can. If not, again, study the piece of fabric, find your straight of grain, make that first cut, and then every cut thereafter will be on grain. So now we're going to sort. We've um, pressed everything, we've cut everything, you've cut out squares, you've cut out templates. Now you want to sort them. You want to sort them by value in lights, mediums, and darks. So you'll notice here on this screen I have some eight and a half inch squares that are sorted in mediums, darks, mediums, and lights, and also a variety of other sizes have been sorted by darks, mediums, and lights. This is when the magic starts happening because your eye is picking up future combinations of fabrics that you're going to be using in quilts. So 
we're going to need to learn to identify value. And I don't get too hung up on identifying value, and you'll see why here in a few minutes. But usually, a scrap will contain more of one value than the other, more dark than light, more medium than dark, etc. But that isn't always the case. If you take a look at a couple of scraps here that I've shown on my screen, there's a blue and white scrap up at the top. It has a pretty even distribution of the medium blue and then the lights. You could do a couple of things with that scrap. You could just simply throw it in your mediums pile for the time being, or you could cut it into fourths, and then you would have a square that had more mediums or more darks. And let's look at the striped fabric at the bottom. That has a pretty even distribution of mediums as well as darks. Right now, I'd probably just throw that in my mediums pile. And here is the key. This is why I don't get too worked up about where exactly, which value pile it needs to be thrown into. When I'm pulling scraps for my pattern, all of the other scraps that I have pulled are going to identify what that striped fabric is going to be. If I've got a really a lot of very dark fabrics, then that striped fabric is probably going to automatically become a medium. And the same thing holds true with the other one. So don't get too concerned about which value pile to put a scrap into. Just place it in a pile, and later on, everything will work itself out. There are value finder tools that you can purchase. They're wonderful tools. They're available from all over the market, um, online, quilt shops, just everywhere. They're available in red and green. And they basically, they remove the color of the fabric to allow just the value to show through. And that helps you to identify which value pile you'll want to throw that scrap into. And I mentioned earlier that I do make sure that I go around my quilting studio and gather all of my template rulers, and I cut up uh, the templates in all the values, from lights to mediums to darks. And this helps me so that whenever I have a quilt that I have to make quickly, I can get to my quilting studio, grab a pile of the lights, mediums, and darks of that particular template, and go to town. I have a quilt done very quickly that way. Another thing that you're going to find in my book is information on how to handle your leftover batting and binding strips. Whenever I remove a quilt from my long arm, I have all of the outside sections of batting and fabrics that I cut away. And I like to cut those into two and a half inch strips so that I can create jelly roll rugs, um, vases, accessories, totes, purses. There's so many things that you can do with that. I just roll up the batting and stack it in a cupboard and I have it available to use for future projects. Now storage, so we've, we've done the pressing, the cutting, and the organizing. Now we have to store this, and the key is to store your fabric stash somewhere where you'll see it and you will use it. If you hide it away somewhere, you're going to forget about it, so make sure you store it somewhere where you use it. Go through your home and identify different containers and things that might work for you to store your, your scrap stash in. You'll see in that photo on the upper left, that is some plastic tubs, that I shoe boxes that I got at the dollar store. They work beautifully to store everything from the one and a half inch scraps to the six and a half inch squares. And also my strips, I, I store my all of my strips of fabric in there as well as my templates. And then I mark them with a labeling machine. I think every quilting studio should have a labeling machine. It's very important. Mark them on all sides of the containers and as well as the top. So now comes the fun part. How do you use your scrap stash to create beautiful quilts from the patterns that you have in your quilt studio? It's so easy and it's really fun to be able to substitute. Just simply take your pattern to your scrap stash and simply pull sizes in various values, lights, mediums, and darks, as well as uh, yardage for your borders. Pull all of that for that pattern. And let's say your pattern calls for an odd size. Maybe it wants a two and three quarter inch square. And as I mentioned earlier, I only cut half inch increments squares for my stash. So what I would do is pull three inch squares and just trim down two sides. It's so much faster to trim down two sides of the squares than just to completely cut out that um, size square from yardage. Half square triangles can also be made very easily and very quickly from, by pulling larger squares than what is required. And I'll show you how that's done here in just a moment. So let's look at some quilts that you, you'll find in my patterns book. This first one is Starlight. And all of these quilts can be made any size that you want them by simply making more of the blocks. So each of the Starlight blocks is a, it finishes at 12 inches. 
For this wall quilt that's pictured here, I just used nine of the Starlight Blacks. And I simply pulled two and a half inch squares in lights and brights, four and a half inch light squares for the center. I pulled larger three inch squares for the half square triangles. And then I pulled white and red fabrics for the border. And then when the quilt was finished, I did free motion feathers and paisleys for this starlight quilt. And here I wanna show you how I do my half square triangles using my scrap stash. So in the photos here, you'll see that I had pulled some seven inch squares. There is a yellow square and an orange square that I pulled. I placed them right sides together. I drew a diagonal line from one corner to the other. I pinned that. I took it to my sewing machine, making sure that all of it was, all of the uh, raw edges were even. And I sewed a scant quarter inch seam allowance on both sides of that drawn line. Then I cut it apart opened it up, pressed it to the dark. And then what's really important is that you trim that square, that half square triangle, to the required size. And the required size for this half square triangle was six and a half inches. So as you can see, once I trimmed it up using that square up ruler and the 45 degree angle, I only had a tiny little remnant all the way around the outer edges that had to be trimmed away. But that is a very important step. Each and every half square triangle needs to be squared up. So here you'll see the number of squares that we need to pull for each starlight black. We're gonna need to pull a four and a half inch light, uh, some two and a half inch lights and brights, some three inch lights, brights and darks, and two of the five inch lights to create our rectangles. So let's see what I've pulled from my scrap stash for this. So these are the squares that I have pulled for my starlight black. As you can see, I have a four and a half inch light for the center. These are my two and a half inch squares and the lights and brights. These are the three inch squares that I've pulled from my half square triangles and the lights, the darks and the mediums or the brights. And these are my five inch squares, which I'm gonna cut in half to obtain the rectangles that I need and two and a half inch wide by four and a half inch long. I'm just gonna cut a half inch off the length to get my rectangles. And this is what you need for one of the starlight blocks. And then you just pull from your stash as many squares as you need to create as many blocks as you like for your starlight quilt. So here is a completed starlight black. As you can see, I pulled a four and a half inch light for the center. I pulled two and a half inch squares in light for the inside of the star points and two and a half inch squares in bright. And of course, this is a Christmas themed block, so it's all in reds and greens. But those are the two and a half inch squares on the outer points of the star. And then all of my half square triangles were made with those three inch squares in darks and brights and lights and you see those encircling the center there. And then the last squares that we had pulled and cut were our rectangles. And we have four rectangles for this particular block. So this starlight block is finished and you can make as many starlight blocks as you need to for whatever size quilt you wish to make. So here's the Marching Monkeys quilt that you'll find in my patterns book. It requires two different blocks, the snail's tail block and the road to Oklahoma. It needs 10 of each of those squares and they finish at 12 inches. I pulled squares and lights in blues, pinks and blacks. I have quite an assortment of stash in my home so I was able to pull specific colors from my stash. And I also made half square triangles from squares and I, once the quilt was finished, you'll see that it has been um, quilted with free motion in the center, and I did ruler work in the borders on my long arm. So let's take a look at the blocks for the Marching Monkeys quilt and the squares that I pulled from my scrap stash. You'll see on the slide the different sizes and values of squares that I pulled from my scrap stash to create the snail's tail block, this Marching Monkeys quilt it consists of two different blocks. The snail's tail block is one of those. And right here, you'll see what I pulled for that snail's tail block. I pulled seven inch squares, six inch, four inch, and three inch squares. Each of those has one light and one dark. And that's going to be, they're each going to be cut on the diagonal and sewn around the four patch unit. And the four patch unit is right here in the whites and the darks. Now let's take a look at what that finished snail's tail block looks like. <laughs> 
So here is a completed snail's tail black, and you'll see the four patch unit was created in the center, and around that, each of the three inch, four inch, six inch, and seven inch squares were cut on a diagonal and then pieced around that four patch unit to create this beautiful snail's tail black. And as you're piecing, you wanna make sure that you maintain the curve of the snail's tail in both the lights and the darks. So this is the second black of the Marching Monkeys quilt. It's called Road to Oklahoma. And you'll see on the screen the different sizes and values of squares that I pulled from my stash to create this block. Now let's take a look at the scraps that I have pulled. Here they are. You'll see pinks, lights, and blacks. And for this particular quilt, I did choose to use specific colors and my scrap stash is large enough that I was able to choose all pinks and lights and all blacks for these and these are the three and a half inch squares i've also chosen some lights and some blues which are four inch squares and i'll be creating the half square triangles from these squares let's take a look at what that marching monkeys road to oklahoma black looks like here is the road to oklahoma black and you'll see here, these are the blacks, the pinks, the whites, and then I made some half square triangles with those four inch squares in the lights and the blues. A very simple block, but it goes together beautifully to create a really pretty marching monkeys quilt. Here is the Irish Dresden quilt that you'll see in my patterns book. It is a 12 inch finished Dresden or Irish chain block. And I pulled lights and brights for both of these blocks. And I also pulled yardage. It's a purple um, border that I placed on here. And once the quilt was finished, I quilted it on my long arm, free motion hand guided quilting with feathers and some other um, ruler work on that particular quilt. All right, let's look at what is needed to create the Irish Dresden's quilt. And the first block in that quilt is the Dresden block. And you'll see on your screen that it requires a background. And you can either piece that together with four six and a half inch light squares, or you can simply use one 12 and a half inch light square for the background. And then you're gonna need uh, six of the lights and six of the brights and a blue square for the center. Let's take a look at what I have pulled from my stash to create that Irish Dresden and black. Here you'll see that I have pulled the six and a half inch squares to create a, a patchwork for the background. So I've got four six and a half inch lights. I have pulled six of the three and a half inch lights, six of the three and a half inch brights, and this is what I'll use to cut out my Dresden blades templates and create that beautiful Dresden flower. And this blue is what I will use to pull the six inch or cut out the six inch circle for the center of that Dresden flower. Now let's take a look at what that Dresden flower is gonna look like when it's finished. Here is that Dresden flower. I simply used a 12 and a half inch square here, as you can see for the background. And then I used six of the brights and six of the lights to piece together my Dresden blades. I applicate them to the background. I cut out a six inch circle from that six inch square and I applicate that to the uh, center of the Dresden flower. Let's take a look at the Irish chain block and see what I've pulled for that. On your screen, you'll see the required uh, sizes and values of squares and strips that are needed. For this particular block, it's needing a lot of rectangles, so I have pulled strips. Let me show you what I've pulled for this block. For the Irish chain, I have pulled 12 of the bright two and a half inch squares. And then for my rectangles, I have gone to my strips container and I've pulled two and a half inch wide strips in various lights from which I will cut my rectangles. I need four and a half inch rectangles and eight and a half inch rectangles that are all two and a half inches wide. So this is a great way to pull those rectangles from your stash. Let's take a look at what that finished Irish chain block looks like.
So here is the finished Irish chain black, and you'll see down the center are the 12 beautiful, bright two and a half inch squares, and then surrounding that are all of the rectangles in light. This is a great stash buster black. It really uses up a lot of your stash very quickly, and it turns into such a beautiful quilt. So even if you just use this block alone, you can create some gorgeous quilts with this particular pattern. This is the Stars and Stripes quilt. It does contain two different blocks. There are six Ohio stars and 14 large half square triangles. And I simply pulled squares in lights, blues, and reds for this quilt. And I pulled 11 and half inch squares from lights, blues, and reds for the half square triangle blocks. I pulled blue yardage and when the quilt was pieced, I got it up on my long arm and I did free motion feather work across the quilt. So the Stars and Stripes quilt is made up of the Ohio star block as well as a large half square triangle block. So you'll see on your screen, there are various sizes of, of red, blues, and lights that are needed for the Ohio star block. Let's see what I have pulled from my stash for that block. You'll see here I've got a deep red center square and I have lights and blues which we'll use to create the flying geese units. We'll need four flying geese units. And here we've got four squares which will be the corner units. So let's take a look at how this goes together to create that Ohio star block. Here is the finished Ohio star block and you'll see the center has the five and a half inch red square and then the flying geese units were made by cutting the four and a half inch lights on the diagonal once and cutting all the blues on the diagonal once and piecing them together to create these beautiful flying geese units and then each corner is a three inch light that completes the block for the Ohio star unit. So let's see how half square triangle blocks are made using your scrap stash. It's a very simple process. So I have pulled for the stars and stripes half square triangle blocks. We need 11 and a half inch squares. So each of these squares is 11 and a half inches. I'm pulling reds and blues and lights. And we're simply gonna sew them together to create the half square triangle. Let me show you how that's done. So here we have a blue square right sides together with a light 11 and a half inch square. They're right sides together, all of the edges meet perfectly. And then you're gonna draw a diagonal line from one corner to the other corner on the, the wrong side of the block here. And then you're going to sew a scant quarter inch seam allowance on each side of the drawn line. I do this in assembly line fashion. When I'm making half square triangles for my scrap stash, I always do it, all of these steps in assembly line fashion, and it makes the job go much more quickly. So once that's all sewn, you're gonna cut on this diagonal line, cut them all apart to create two half square triangle units. So here is one of the units. If you look at this, this is what it looked like when it was cut apart, and then it was pressed with a a seam allowance pressed to the dark and now what you need to do is actually trim the half square triangle unit so that it matches the Ohio star block and that was a ten and a half inch unfinished so this has to be trimmed to ten and a half inches square it's very important whenever you do make half square triangles using this process that each and every half square triangle unit is pressed and then trimmed up and squared up to the measurement that the pattern requires and this particular one is ten and a half inches this is the California Maze quilt, and it only cries one block, the road to California. It finishes at 12 inches, and I made 16 blocks for the center of this quilt. And you'll notice that I basically just uh, twisted the square on the diagonal on each row, and it created that beautiful pattern. I pulled squares and lights, brights, and mediums, and I pulled yardage, navy blue yardage. It's just a, a narrow one inch, uh, border that goes around the center and the outside of that quilt and it does have a pieced border as well and I did a simple edge-to-edge -edge panto on my long arm when the quilt was finished. 
So for the California maize quilt, there's only one block that's required for that quilt, and it's simply tilted on a diagonal throughout each row to create the beautiful pattern. So each block, as you can see on the screen, requires lights, mediums, and darks. There are 10 two and a half inch lights, 10 two and a half inch mediums, and then there's half square triangles that require four and a half inch lights and darks. Let's take a peek at what I have pulled from my scrap stash to create that California maize block. So you'll see here I have 10 two and a half inch brights, 10 two and a half inch lights, and I have two darks and two lights of the four and a half inch squares to create my half square triangles. This is what I needed to pull for each of the California maize blocks. Now let's take a look at what that block looks like finished. And here it is. California maize block, you'll see that it is simply four patch units in each corner using the lights and the brights. And then I've created four half square triangles using the lights and the darks. And that dark helps to create that beautiful diagonal pattern that you see in the California maize quilt. A very simple block to create. So let me show you my a couple of my tubs that contain scrap stash. This is my two and a half inch tub that is identified here. And you'll see that inside this tub, I have medium two and a half inch squares and light two and a half inch squares. In another tub, I have all of my dark two and a half inch squares. I have quite a few of them cut. But what I'm able to do is take my quilt patterns to my stash of tubs and simply pull scraps from my tub. Let's say a pattern requires 50 mediums. I can gather 50 of them or 50 of the lights. I can gather what I need from my tubs and simply take them along with my pattern to my sewing machine and begin sewing the quilt. Let me show you my three inch tub. Here you'll see in the three inch tub I actually have lights and mediums and darks and I have a few leftover half square triangles from previous projects. I will often throw those in that corresponding tub so that I can use them on upcoming projects. But it is a wonderful way to use up your leftover scraps from other projects that you've cut and organized into tubs by size and value. It's a great way to make beautiful quilts quickly. I hope each one of you will begin your own journey in speedy solutions to scrap quilting. Establish a time each week or each month to maintain control over your scraps. Set up an area by your TV, listen to some great music, grab a friend. Choose a pattern to create your first beautiful scrappy quilt from your very own scrap stash, and then enjoy the end results. I wanna thank each and every one of you for joining me today as I've shared with you my speedy solutions to cut and organize your scraps. Hi, I'm Deanna Springer. Thank you for joining us for the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show and thank you for tuning in for Speedy Solutions to Cut and Organize Your Stash with Lori Dickman. We're pleased to have Lori with us today, uh, live from her studio in Illinois. Welcome, Lori. Thank you so much, Deanna. It's great to be here. It's so great to see you and thank you for taking time with us today to answer questions about your lecture. And we have lots of questions, so we'll get started right away, Lori. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> uh, Carol is asking in the chat, uh, please dis define the word scrap. Is it anything less than a fat quarter or a fat eighth? A scrap to me can be, you know, a fat quarter or less. It can also be just those unusual remnants that you have left over from previous projects. Could even be a three quarters of a yard and you just don't know what you're going to do with it. And you can then, I would use that and actually cut it up. I probably cut a lot of 10 inch squares and maybe even some 12 and a half inch squares from those larger pieces. Because I do like to have those large squares in my stash in those three values, lights, mediums, and darks. And Karen is asking, if there is no salvage on the scrap, how do you determine the straight of grain and cut cross grain? Okay, so what you'll want to do is study that 
piece or that scrap very, very carefully. You may need a magnifying glass, but there are crosswise and lengthwise grains of fabric there. And you'll just want to lay your ruler on the lengthwise or crosswise grain as closely as possible to make your first cut. Once you do that, then every cut thereafter will have a straight line from which you can cut the rest of your scraps. Great tip. And Marlene is asking, do you just cut squares? No strips or rectangles? Oh, I cut everything. <laughs> I cut a lot of squares, which uh, pr predominantly most of it is squares and various sizes from one and a half inches to 12. I also take all of the templates in my studio. I have many, many different template rulers, the Dresdens, the Drunkard's Paths, the Hexies, the Periwinkles, all different kinds, tumblers. I will bring them to my uh, quilting craft table and I will actually cut lots of fabric using those. I'll make sure I cut them up in lights, mediums, and darks as well. I want to be able to have a nice stash of those if I need to make a quilt quickly. I also have lots of strips. So I have container shoe boxes filled with containers of strips strips and I cut strips from one and a half to four and a half inches. So I'll, um, any leftover pieces of scraps that are nice and long ones, I will cut strips because you need those for a lot of different reasons in quilting. So I make sure that I have those in various sizes in lights, mediums, and darks. Great. And Doris is asking, when you use Mary Ellen's Best Press or other starch products, do you get bugs? That's a really good question. Um, whenever you're using any kind of starch that does contain a sugar, it's a sugar product, so it will attract bugs. So it's important that you store your scraps in airtight containers. I like to purchase um, the tubs, that they're called shoebox tubs. You can get them at the dollar store, but you do have to be careful to purchase those that have seal, they have good seals. If they don't have a good seal, then you might have an issue with bugs. I personally have not had any issues with them, but I do keep all of my scraps in airtight containers. And my studio is in the basement. Great tip. And Michelle is asking, any thoughts? Do you have any thoughts about using a Cricut maker to help tame the load of scraps? That is a wonderful idea. Um, I do have a Cricut, which I use for card making, but I have not even thought about using it for cutting my fabric. That is a fabulous idea. I think it would be wonderful to use that. And you certainly could tame your load of scraps using the Cricut and cutting out various sizes and shapes. It's a great idea. I would recommend trying that. Even some circles, perhaps. Ah, yes, uh, all kinds of templates. Mm -hmm. Carol is asking, do you store anything by color or theme like Christmas fabrics or calf facet fabrics? I do, yes. I've actually inherited scrap stashes from other, from two women, actually. They're, I have a huge amount of fabric here, and I have a very large Christmas-themed fabric. I have a very large Asian. I have a number of different um, areas in my uh, quilting studio where I have themed fabrics. And there's typically yardage is what is involved there. Sometimes it might just be fat quarters, but I do have, um, I store my fabrics in tubs. Um, I store them in cubes. I have some pullout drawers in my basement in, in my studio where I also fold those up and I've got them in themes. So not only do I store my scraps in the uh, airtight containers by value and size, but I also do have some other fabrics that are stored in my studio. Um, in uh, various other areas. I do store batting. I think I mentioned that in my lecture. I um, cut off the edges of my batting from when I've taken a quilt off my long arm. I'll cut that up in two and a half inch strips and I'll roll those up and I'll use tho those as well as two and a half inch strips of other fabrics and um, make uh, jelly roll rugs and purses and totes and so forth. So there's different areas in my quilt studio that I have it organized by, you know, subject, uh, different types types of uh, products, whether it's the scraps, whether it's the strips, whether it's the templates, or whether it's the, the themed fabrics. Uh, speaking of strips, Lori, we have a question about st uh, st the two and a half inch strips. Robin is asking, what is the minimum length of your two and a half inch strip? When is it a, a rectangle and when is it a strip? You know, I don't really have a limit on that. I suppose 
the strip has to be anywhere from maybe six to nine inches before I'll throw it in my strips box because that's something that I can possibly use as I may be doing a log cabin or something. Um, if it was shorter than that, I may just cut it up into actual squares. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carol is asking, do you toss out the pieces that can't make it at least to the minimum one and a half, half inch square? Or what do you sew with, uh, do you sew several strips together to make a larger scrap? What do you do with those really small bits? Those really small scraps are something that I will put in a um, pet pillow. In fact, I have uh, the, the pet pillow pattern is in my techniques book. And it is something that I'll make it up and I'll tape it or clip it to my craft table. And as I'm cutting up my stash and I've got little tiny pieces or even salvage pieces, I'll throw those in that pillow and it will stuff the pillow. And every six to eight months, then I end up with a new pillow for my pet that um, takes advantage of all those teeny tiny scraps. That way, none of that is going into the trash. So that is a pattern that I do have available in that techniques book. Great, thanks for sharing that, Laurie. And we have a few people brainstorming about using the AccuQuilt uh, and the uh, Cricut cutter. Uh, Michelle P has an AccuQuilt cutter, and would you starch the fabric as you would when you're using rulers? Yes, I think that I would. It would allow it, I believe, to lay better on the um, AccuQuilt or, or even on the Cricut. I think I would absolutely starch the fabric first. Plus you're going to remove the wrinkles once you've oppressed it. So I think that's an important mm -hmm. part of it. The starching is a great uh, tip. And as long as we're talking about the Cricut, Fariel says I had uh, read in uh, that the Cricut could be problematic with fabric cutting, even if the mat and blade, uh, she, she uh, saw that in her Facebook Cricut group. So that starching is where that would be key. True, that would help to keep mm -hmm. it more solid, mm -hmm. solidly on the, on the mat in which it's being um, stuck right. to. So I like how the viewers are getting really creative in, in thinking they about are. how they I could uh, cut and organize their stash. And we have lots more questions about your studio in the container, is in the containers you use. And a viewer in the chat is asking, are there photos and pictures of your studio and your storage containers uh, containing the various cuts? You know, I have um, pictures of that in my lectures that I present. And so what I'll need to do is get that out and post it on my website so that you can see that. And I'll definitely be sure to do that. So you'll have to check out my site, quiltingwithlori.com and uh, check out the blogs. And I'll get some out there so that you can see the ways that I store not only my scraps and my templates, but my yardage and my fat quarters and the, the batting and so forth. So definitely, I will do that. That's a great question. We'd love to see your organization in your studio. It's always fun to see other quilters studio uh, mm -hmm. studios. And Doris is asking, a uh, ballpark figure, how many containers are we talking here, Lori, uh, <laughs> that you have uh, to organize your stash? When I got started with this, um, in my book, I, I, um, I will allow, you know, I'll say three, but I continue to gather more and more stash. I try to be really faithful. Every time I do a project, if someone gives me something and I'm doing a project for them and the little scraps, I will try to get them cut up and organized and sorted and put away. But sometimes I don't get to it right away. So that pile starts growing again. But I probably had, when I started this process years ago, I probably had five to seven huge tubs. I don't know if you remember the tubs that were pictured at the beginning of the lecture, but I had huge tubs and I just couldn't part with them because I knew this is great fabric and it can be used to make beautiful quilts, but I just had to come up with a system that would work for me. And so that's how I came up with Speedy Solutions. This is a system that works well for me and I hope it works for you all. And um, I was able to get them cut and organized. And I, I've made some wonderful quilts. I've just had so much fun with it. Edith on Facebook is asking, Lori, how many hours a day do you spend on uh, your quilting, your cutting, your sorting, your sewing? <laughs> when I am able to quilt and cut and sort, I would say I'd probably spend evenings, you know, four to five hours in the evenings. Um, I, I also have another job. So I'm a very busy lady, busy in the daytime, busy in the evenings. So um, I would love to be able to spend more time, but it's probably four to five hours in the evenings. 
and uh, sometimes on the weekends, but um, I definitely don't get to quilt as much as I would love to. And it seems this last year, I've been spending much more time on virtual lectures that I've been giving. So um, it's been a lot more computer work than actual quilting this year, but hopefully next year I'll get back to some more quilting. Um, I do have another book in mind that I'm, I'm working on for next year. We'll, we'll stay tuned to your uh, website and your e-news to learn more about that book that, you have, that you're working Great. on. And Sharon in Detroit is asking, do you store by value and size, like mostly size, uh, then what are the three values? The values are light, medium, and dark. And um, I typically will store in, in a particular tub, I'll separate my sizes, like from if there's one and a half, I'd so separate them by lights, mediums, and dark within a tub. At some point in my, my two and a half inch tubs, tend to get grow very quickly. So I will often have entire two and a half inch tubs that are filled with nothing but lights or nothing but mediums or nothing but darks. And that's because my stash has grown. That means it's time to make some quilts <laughs> so you can reduce your stash. But um, I start out by storing them, sorting them within the tub, lights, mediums, and darks. Those three values are very important when you make a quilt that gives the contrast and that gives the interest to the quilt. And that what's, that's what catches the eye and makes the quilt beautiful. And that really shines in the quilt behind you. It's a beautiful quilt that, that has the lights, mediums, and darks, and it really, it's really popping and so beautiful. Thank you. This is Irish Dresden's behind me here. It's beautiful, Laurie. One of the books in the patterns book, mm -hmm. or one of the quilts in the patterns book. Great. And Joe is asking, uh, besides a sharp blade, uh, any rotary cutting tips so you don't get a sore arm? And do you have a favorite rotary cutter? And that kind of ties in with another question that we have from Joe. Uh, have you ever used a rotating rotary mat? Yes, I have. For the ro rotary cutters, first of all, I have a variety of them. and. Um, I, I like all of them. I really don't have a preference one over the other. Um, your arm may get tired uh, as you're doing, if you have a whole evening of nothing but cutting up scraps, you may get tired, you might have to take a break. And then what I'll do is go do some more pressing of the scraps and then come over and cut. So give yourself a break as you are going through the process. Um, and what was the other question? You covered it with the rotating cutting mat. Anything in oh, addition yes. to help us with fatigue? Maybe yes. maybe limiting the time we're cutting. Yes, and the rotating mat. I have a small one and I have a large one. And the rotating mat will help um, you to be able to cut things much more quickly even because you're you're not having to pick up that piece and turn it and then re, um, realign the ruler. You actually can keep the ruler there, just rotate the mat and continue cutting. So that is a really great technique and tip to um, do this quickly is to have a rotating mat. And I, those I uh, square that. rulers really help with that too, with the rotating yes. mat and your square rulers, yes. the different size square mm -hmm. rulers. And Absolutely. Benita is asking, is there a rule of thumb for the size of squares needed when creating half square triangles? My rule of thumb for the way I create my half square triangle, let's say I needed a three and a half inch um, completed half square triangle. What I would do is go to my stash and pull four inch squares, a light and a dark or a medium and a dark, whatever the color combination you need. I would put them right sides together. My, I would draw a line diagonally from one corner to the other. And I would sew a very scant, not, not a quarter inch, but a scant quarter inch seam allowance on each side of that drawn line and then cut on the drawn line. That way I'm not eating into my seam allowance because there's the turn of cloth you have to take into account as well. Then I would press it open and then it's really important to square that up. And when I just use a half inch um, larger square than what I'm needing for the finished um, a half square triangle, I have very little that has to be trimmed off. If you saw in the demonstration there, there was just a tiny little bit that needs to be uh, trimmed away. And that I just add to my uh, pet pillow bag as it's hanging there on my craft table. And there's very little waste then. That's how I have um, done the half square triangles. And I typically uh, do them all in assembly line. So they're done very, very quickly. 
but a half an inch larger has always worked for me. If you tend to sew a very large a quarter inch or maybe a little bit larger than a quarter of an inch, you might wanna go an inch larger on the squares that you choose. And that way you can trim it down to what you need it to be. Great tips, thank you, Laurie. A uh, viewer in Arizona is asking, uh, oh, well, she's a, it's more of a comment. I saved the cutoff strips for my husband to use as tomato ties for gardening, a great repurposing <laughs> method. Absolutely, that's mm -hmm. great, mm -hmm. absolutely. Another mm -hmm. viewer is asking, uh, Marlene is asking, do you save salvages to use in your projects? You know, I have thought of that so often, I'm often chopping them up and throwing them in the pet pillow. And I'm thinking, you know, I should I should do something with these. And I just haven't yet done that. I've had so many other projects on my plate. Um, but there are so many wonderful things that you can do with salvages. So that might be something that you all might want to consider saving and creating some interesting new fabric with salvages. <laughs> Great tips. And a viewer on Facebook is asking, Lori, how large is your studio for all your storage? Well, I actually have three different rooms. <laughs> My sewing room is upstairs. It's in a sunroom. Um, that's where I sew. The area here where I've got my um, videography area, this is my quilting studio downstairs and it is very large. It's probably, oh, 18 by 30 long. And then my long arm is in another room <laughs> in the basement. And that's also a very large room because my long arm is, uh, the table itself is 12, in, 12 feet long. So I have to have a lot of room on each side and six feet wide. So it does take up quite a bit of room. So this is a hobby that uses a lot of space. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Susan is asking, do you incorporate scraps into your quilt backings? Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, I have a couple of uh, quilts that I have done that are gonna be part of another lecture that I'm putting together where I have just put together nothing but scraps for the backs of the quilt. It's a fabulous way to use up your scraps, especially if it's kind of an ugly fabric that you really you know, may not care for, but putting it together with other squares and then putting together, putting it on the back of the quilt, it can be really beautiful just and very warm and, and just perfect for a, a utilitarian type quilt. And many viewers are asking Lori about, do you have handouts or tip sheets and uh, books? I know we talked about your books, but let's recap that because you have, you have two books and tell us about each of your books. I do. Um, these are the two books. This first one is a techniques book. And the techniques book is the one that goes step by step through what I've taught in the lecture. And it teaches you everything you need to know about how to get your scraps cut and organized and ready to use in um, your quilts. It also has five patterns and this does include that pet pillow pattern. And then the patterns book, which is this one, it's a larger one. It has 12 additional scrappy patterns in there. And you saw many of those quilts in the demos that I did in the lecture, you saw a number of them. All of that is available out on my website, quiltingwithlori.com. And I am offering a special out there. So you wanna check out my um, online store. Uh, the show itself has, I'm, I'm vending here at the sh in the show and you'll see a link there for some free shipping and so forth. So check out the vending list there on quiltshow.com. And uh, so my books are out there, my patterns are out there, my templates are out on my uh, website. I do have some uh, free patterns that I can send to anyone who would like those. It, it's kind of an overview of what I spoke on today. So you are welcome to contact me through my website, quiltingwithlori.com. Go to the contacts link on that website and just email me and ask me for that free PDF. And I would love to send that to you. I also have on my uh, website, quiltingwithlori.com, a free ebook that you can sign up for in my newsletter. So locate that, it's a quilt, there's an icon on the homepage, it's a quilt on a porch. Click on that and you can sign up for my free ebook and newsletter. So check all of that out, but I would love to send that to you. That's great, Lori. We look forward to connecting with you on your website, uh, as you mentioned, and that's where we can sign up for your e-news and learn more about your new book, your third book that you're working on. Yes. So we'll all right. stay tuned. Um, 
And it's, uh, it's so great talking with you today. And sh thank you for sharing all of your cutting and organizing tips. I think we'll all have our, our stash in scraps in a fine shape heading into next year's quilt show. So we look great. forward to sharing stories yes. and photos with you next year and even on your social I sites. Would I would love that. Please do share your, your mm -hmm. quilts and your stories and any questions that you might have. Please don't hesitate to go out to my site and contact me through my uh, email there. And um, I love to lecture and do workshops across the country virtually and in person. I'd love to visit you personally at your guild sometime in the future. So thank you so much. You're so very welcome. And thank everyone. I think it's so grateful everyone's tuning in today for watching and uh, joining us for the Great Wisconsin Quilt Show. And head over to quiltshow.com and click on the vendor mall and that's where you'll, you'll find Lori's website, Quilting with Lori. And be sure to check out all the spe spectacular quilt exhibits, including the special 4-H community quilt. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us. This year's educational presentations are made possible with your contributions. Your support helps us offer a free and accessible online experience where we can celebrate our shared love of quilting. Please help PBS Wisconsin bring back the event next year stronger than ever by making a gift today. You can donate on our website or text QUILT to 1-800-236-3636 to make a gift from your phone. Your generosity makes a difference. Thank you.